Listen, I tell you, I can't relax, you know? My dog drives me nuts. My dog. He wants me to mate him. I wouldn't mate him. Let him go through what I go through. I mean, last week was rough. Are you kidding? Last week I looked up my family tree. Two dogs were using it. And I tell you, my wife isn't too smart, you know. One night she went out, some guy stole the car. I took you to see what he looked like. She told me she got the license plate number. Oh, my wife. Oh, one night she told me she felt romantic. I took her to a drive-in movie. I spent the whole night trying to find out what car she was in. This afternoon, my wife cracked up the car again. I was out driving her. She told me she would make a U-turn. I'll tell you the letter she made. You'll never find any of them. Oh, he's a strange doctor. Strange doctor. Oh, hey, you kidding? I asked him if my heart was strong enough for sex. He told me not if I join in, you know? <laughs> I'll tell you my trouble. I got the wrong doctor. You know my doctor, Dr. Vinnie Boombach. Know my doctor? What a doctor. Well, I called him last week. I told him, Doc, I swallowed a bottle of sleeping pills. He told me to have a few drinks and get some rest. <laughs> Life's not easy. Not easy. You not can't easy. trust doctors either. They're all mixed up. You, you really kidding? think so, huh? Uh, my proctologist used to be a photographer. Yeah. Hey, he took x-rays, told me to bend over and say cheese. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. I told my wife I want to die in bed. She said, again? <laughs> and I'm getting old. I'm not a kid anymore. I know I'm getting old. In Vegas, I played a slot machine. Three prunes came up. Oh. I know I'm getting old. I'm at the age now, if I hear someone goes both ways, I figure it's number one and number two, you know. <laughs> I tell you, I don't get a break with nothing. I joined Gamblers Anonymous. They gave me two to one, I don't make it. <laughs> oh, boy, the other night in Las Vegas, I'll tell you, I got loaded on what I'm doing. I played dice, I lost a thousand bucks. I got even, though, I stole 400 sweet and lows. <laughs> Good morning. It is Tuesday, December the 27th, and this is The True Conservative. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today. So today, after the Daily Declaration for Spiritual Warfare, the Pledge of Allegiance, and the Star-Spangled Banner, we will have No Free Lunch and Chapter 24 of Hijinks. All that and more when I get back. Thank you, thank you. And now the Daily Declaration for Spiritual Warfare for December 27th. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen. And that was the Daily Declaration for Spiritual Warfare, Biblical Principles to Defeat the Devil for December 27th.
Thank you, thank you. And now there's no free lunch. It is the trend of debt to GDP more than anything else that is disturbing. I mean, the trend is more each year. And as you take more each year, it means you are taking a larger and larger share of the new money in the economy. At some point, that becomes a disincentive to production or a disincentive in the private sector, and the general economy starts to slow down. I think that the rationale for looking at expenses rather than at the deficit is that the expenses are the amount of money that the government is taking out of the private sector. Whether it takes those by taxes or by borrowing them is kind of a secondary matter. The primary matter is how much money is it taking. That's measured by expenditures. Robert L. Bartley. The discovery I had some time back that the size of government relative to the economy was the most important indicator in the economy had a profound impact on me. It explained why the economy has still grown handsomely, even in periods of high deficits, where the percentage of the government within the economy was not growing. The key issue was and is incentives. A larger government, even without deficit spending, crowds out the private sector and ultimately disincentivizes productive activity. A smaller government with deficit spending is less problematic for economic incentives. It is the belief that incentives matter, human action, that forms my view of government spending relative to the size of the economy. And that was, there's no free lunch. 250 Economic Truths by David Bonson. Thank you, thank you. And now, chapter 24 of Hijinks. Chapter 24. At 3.15 that afternoon, there was a knock on the door of Fleetwood's hotel suite. Hastily, he donned his beard and went over to open the door. He was confronted by a stout woman of businesslike manner, followed by a young man carrying, or attempting to do so. The object was half lifted, half pushed into the hotel room. A large suitcase. You are Mr. Bjorn Henningsen, she stated in a declaratory English. Yes, he said. I am Nadia Balienkov, assistant librarian, University of Moscow, at your service. She did not introduce her young man. She simply motioned him to lug the suitcase into the living room. Where would you like it? Alastair Fleetwood, for the moment confused, pointed vaguely at a corner of the room. Thither the porter went. I hope, Mr. Henningson, that these titles are to your liking. Comrade Balienkov approached the heavy cardboard suitcase, opened her handbag, and took out a key. She opened it, kneeling down on the floor. Inside the suitcase were about fifty books. Fleetwood approached it, took up one of them, Jane Austen's Emma, and another, Moby Dick, a third, for whom the bell tolls. He turned to Comrade Balienkov. That is most kind of you to look after me. I shall take good care of these books, and of course you will have them back. How do I arrange to call you? Comrade Balienkov pulled a card from her handbag, gave it to Fleetwood, and said, When you are ready for us to come to take the books back, you will simply inform the concierge on your floor, and she will notify us. Alastair Fleetwood bowed, and without further ado, motioning to the young man to follow her, Comrade Balienkov walked to the door, opened it, and left. At six o'clock, the telephone rang. He had been expecting the ring with feverish anxiety, sedated only after the books came, which had made the last few hours pass by more quickly. Alice Goodyear Corbett was manifestly excited, but she was being cryptic, leaving it to Alistair Fleetwood to piece together the meaning of what she said. She spoke with unusual formality. Bjorn, she said, with heavy accent on his pseudonymous first name, I have had a very pleasant afternoon visiting with old friends. We talked at great length about you, and my friends are great admirers of yours. That is the first thing I wanted to tell you. And one of those friends, the the senior of those friends, is most anxious to meet you and to have a nice visit with you. He is not at this moment in Moscow, but will be here later on this evening, and he hopes, I hope, you will not object to meeting with him at a rather unusual hour. He would be available shortly after midnight. 
Alistair Fleetwood had several reactions to what he had been told. Triumph, clearly. Unless he had drastically misunderstood the infractuous message of Alice Goodyear Corbett, the great god Bierya had backed down and agreed to see him. But immediately following that agreeable sensation of victory, it came to him that Bierya was clearly imposing his own idiosyncratic schedule on his distinguished British visitor. A means of domesticating me, Fleetwood immediately thought. He paused. He was tempted to tell Alice that really at midnight he would be much too tired to keep spirited company with her friend. But a third reaction, modifying the second, rescued him from humiliation. He could accept the midnight meeting hour in the spirit of security. After all, he was here in order to consummate a most private commission. Under the circumstances, he might, without loss of dignity, respond to a midnight invitation as though he thought the hour selected with the single purpose in mind of maximizing security. All this was done with only a moment's hesitation. And so he answered her. Why, of course, Alice. Midnight is fine with me. I understand the requirements. Dramatic pause. There is, of course, a condition to all of this, which is that you and I will dine together in our accustomed, civilized way. Only I fear it will be up to you to cope with the requirements of room service here. My Russian is not up to it. Alice Goodyear Corbett, manifestly relieved by his reaction, smiled. Of course, my darling. I will be with you at eight, and I'll make all the arrangements. You did get the books? Alice called back a half hour later. I did get the books, and I thank you most heartily for them. I am so glad. Well, of course, I've made the arrangements. You do like caviar? Do you not, Bjorn? I like caviar very much. Never mind that I disapprove of anything that costs one hundred pounds per kilo. Plutocratic, conspicuous consumption. But since it needs to be consumed, I shall make the sacrifice. You will see me at eight o'clock. She permitted herself an indiscretion, Alastair thought, by closing. Entirely prepared for you, dear Bjorn. On the other hand, he supposed the KGB, judging from her fright earlier in the day, knew everything. They are, after all, supposed to know everything, he reminded himself, though he did not very much relish that anyone else should know everything about himself and Alice. She had arrived at eight, told Alistair Fleetwood that the dinner would arrive at nine. They had both reenacted their rituals and were in bed in intimate union. When the doorbell rang, rang once, paused only momentarily, rang again, followed by peremptory persistent use of the brass door knocker. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, Alice Goodyear Corbett said, her voice a tangle of emotions. I will go to the door. Oh, darling, forgive all of this. Disengaged, she got up and then said, My goodness, I have no robe. I must dress. She sprinted to the bathroom while the knocking on the door proceeded at progressively imperious tempo. In record time, Alice Goodyear Corbett, her dress on, sped past the bedroom into the living room and opened the door. Through the slight opening of the bedroom door, Alistair Fleetwood could see three Russian waiters wheeling a huge trolley of foods into the living room, accompanying it with heated conversation. Alice was evidently reproaching them for bringing the dinner a full forty-five minutes before it had been expected, the head waiter protesting something or other, all of it in energetic, polemical tones. And then suddenly the three waiters were gone, the food and the large tray of bottles left on the table. Fleetwood got up out of bed, dressed himself with only absolutely essential attire, and walked into the living room. Really, Alice, I do think these arrangements most awfully clumsy. She explained that evidently the management of National Hotel had been instructed to pay such special attention to the desires of Mr. Bjorn Henningsen that in the eagerness to please the management had advanced the schedule she had stipulated. Her voice was soothing, and the odor of the chicken Kiev and the sight of the rare, in Russia, white French burgundy in the ice cooler soothed Alistair Fleetwood. He even permitted himself a laugh. I think I shall propose a new maxim to the lexicographers, he said. He drew his head back a bit, closing his eyes, a posture he used frequently in class when he struggled visibly to decoct from the tumult of his stochastic knowledge a special truth, a fresh formulation even. Quitus interruptus causa splendidissimi convivii. The act of love interrupted by reason of the most splendid feast. 
You like that, Alice, my dear? She said she did like it, and admired it, and that it confirmed everything she thought about him, including his wonderful good sportsmanship. And so they began their dinner as usual, except that when time came for the traditional liqueur, she cautioned, finger to her lips, That's not tonight, darling. Not until after our meeting with our friend. I think we had better be very careful until then. Alistair Fleetwood nodded good-naturedly and put the top back on the bottle of Kirsch. It had really gone splendidly, Alistair reflected, the following morning when he woke at 8.30. The car had been there waiting for them at 11.15. They were in the waiting room at the Lubyanka at 11.45. And at exactly midnight they were called into the office. Bierya had risen and walked over toward Alistair Fleetwood as though he were a close friend, arrived on a surprise visit. Pierre kissed Fleetwood on both cheeks, threw his arms about him, and walked him toward the chair by his desk. He was talking rapidly, Alice struggling in spurts to interpret. He had been most fearfully embarrassed and put out on learning that his Minister of State Security had dealt so off-handedly with Pierre's distinguished guest. What had happened was a reflection of the top security status of the operation in which Comrade Bjorn, this was followed by a he-he-he and a wink at Alice Goodyear Corbett, was playing so vital a role. At that moment the door had opened, and two trolleys were wheeled in with vodka and caviar and hot onion soup, and in moments the four of them, Yosef, a youngish, tall, sallow, blonde man wearing a double-breasted black suit, who had kept seated in the corner of the room during the whole period, was perfunctorily introduced as my aide comrade Yosef, were seated around the table, and Pierre was telling comrade Bjorn how highly he was prized in the Kremlin, and how vital was his current mission. After vodka had been poured for the third time, and the trolleys removed, Lavrienti Pavlovich addressed Fleetwood. The operation, he said, needed to go forward immediately. He showed, and for this Fleetwood was grateful and impressed, a meticulous knowledge of the physical requirements of the mini Zerka, as Fleetwood had described them in the several sessions, personal and by radio with Alice Goodyear Corbett. The requisite space had been located. It was appropriately situated to provide the mini Zerka with a line of sight to a certain office. Fleetwood had said that an intervening structure would not, in fact, interdict the desired communications, but that a slight blur might result, so that the operation was best carried out between a building and the Kremlin window without great steel things in between, as Fleetwood had put it in an idiomatic communication to Alice Goodyear Corbett. The mini Zerka was situated, Lavrienti Pavlovich advised Fleetwood, in exactly such a situation. The specified electrical requirements had been met. All that is now needed, Bierya said, wrinkling his face into a composite of fleshly wickedness, force-fed by the demands of amiability. All that was now needed, in fact, was the enabling of the machine, and instructions to the technician on how to maintain it in operation. Here, Lavrienti Pavlovich smiled. I have a wonderful surprise for you. Not only a wonderful surprise for you, Comrade Bjorn, but a wonderful surprise for our friend here. He pointed to Alice. The technician in charge of the Zerka will be Comrade Belushi. Alice Goodyear Corbett turned sharply to Bierya, exclaiming in rapid Russian, causing Bierya to reply in rapid Russian, leaving Alistair Fleetwood with little to contribute, though he sensed that Comrade Belushi was somebody very important or somehow controversial. In due course, Bierya turned to his guest, waiting for his interpreter to speak. Alice found it difficult to interpret a passage at once so impersonal and so personal. Comrade Belushi, Alice exactly relayed the words spoken slowly by Bierya, is the proud husband of no less and Bierya raised his vodka glass and bowed in the direction of Alice Goodyear Corbett. Alastair Fleetwood had not supposed that his visit in Moscow would involve an acquaintance with the creature Alice had been required as a matter of administrative convenience to marry. He did not look forward to receiving as his pupil the man he had cuckolded. But on the other hand, war was war, so to speak, and his happening physically on comrade Belushi would not in any way interfere with the large hold on his emotions that Alice Goodyear Corbett occupied. So all he could think to say was, How convenient, Lavrienti Pavlovich. And looking to one side at Alice, a tiny shrug of the shoulders. So what? 
She returned the gesture with a suddenly affected indifference. As they were being driven back to the hotel, Fleetwood reminded himself that he had intended to ask Beria some direct questions about the implications of this rather serious gesture of intra-Kremlin politics. But he confessed to himself he had been so much taken by the hospitality, Beria's gratitude for favors past, Beria's admiration of Fleetwood's continuing work for the revolution. All of this had caused Fleetwood to put aside his pronouncing questions, his curiosity had prompted him to ask. And so, as wearily he slid into bed at three in the morning for the second successive night, he blanked out what his musical colleague at Trinity liked to call the hemidemi-semi quavers. What mattered was that the revolution marched forward, and that, unquestionably, the most brilliant young scientist in the Western world was performing indispensable services for that revolution. It was, of course, comforting to know that the full measure of his importance was known to the chief of the KGB, that vast vital system geared to contend with the subtle fascist machinations of reactionaries inside and outside the boundaries of the Soviet Socialist Republic. And that evening, Sir Alastair Fleetwood, Nobel laureate, pride of British science, the envy of lesser men all over the world, had dined in the sanctum sanctorum of revolutionary intelligence, in intimate contact with its head, that squat, ugly, fleshy little man, who Alastair Fleetwood was convinced was the principal custodian of Soviet security. And that was chapter 24 of the book Hijinks by William F. Buckley Jr. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. This is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States today, bidding adios to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. Until next time, remember that the left has no authority, no power, and they can't win.